What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to the first ever Miss Quinn Faze Get Ready With Me video. So if you are not up to date on what we are doing here, what I'm going to do today is basically give you a synopsis of a book that we've all decided to read together. What we are discussing today is A Court of Thorns and Roses. We are discussing from chapters one through the end of chapter 23. And basically I'm just going to give you a synopsis of the book and insert my little opinions and things I noticed while I talk about it and do my makeup. And I'm specifically going to be doing my makeup with these new Huda Beauty Neon Obsessions palettes. Um, I tried the orange one yesterday. So today I think I'm going to use mostly the pink one in this video. I may have dipped into one or two colors from the orange one, but 99% of it was definitely from the pink. I'm not going to do a proper review on these just yet, but I will be doing one of those soon. I'm going to do a three looks video with it most likely by the end of this week, but I will be using them for my get ready with me today. Also, if you want to know any of the makeup that I put on my face while I'm talking, I'm not going to be talking about the actual makeup because I'm going to be too busy running my mouth about this book. But if you want to know what I used, if you like the way anything looks, I'm going to list everything that I use in the description down below. Just a couple of things to get out of the way. First of all, this series is very much inspired by Bailey Sarian. I really love her murder mystery makeup Mondays. Obviously, this this is very different because it's not about murder mystery, but just the concept of like including something else that we all love and sitting down and doing it like get ready with me style is what inspired me to do this. So I would like to say thank you to her for inspiring me to try something a little bit different on my channel and also for doing those videos because I look forward to them every week and I think they're amazing. Obviously, if you have not read this series or not read up to where we are in this series, uh, there are going to be tons of spoilers, but if you are not interested in actually reading these books or if you don't care, if you know in advance what's going on in the books, please feel free to stick around anyway. I'm just going to be doing makeup get ready with me style and basically telling you a story about like sexy fairies. That's it. That's basically it. That being said, in this part of the book, there wasn't like totally a ton of sexually explicit content. But there's definitely some stuff that if you're not comfortable with that, then you might not be super comfortable with like what we're talking about because there is some like, not like outright sexual assault, but there are hints of that. So like, if you don't want to hear like that type of a situation, then maybe this isn't the video for you. Also definitely not the book for you because they do bring that up several times. Just felt like I should let you guys know that before we get into it. The second half of this book is like, porn. It is Sex City, but we won't really get into that part today. That starts like in the second half of this book. So uh, for today, we're keeping it pretty clean. The next installation of this series might be a little bit different. Before we get into it, please don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoy this concept and you want me to do more because that lets me know. And also it really just helps me out. And if you are new here, go ahead and subscribe because if you watch the first half of this video, you're gonna wanna know what happens in the second half of the book and come back and talk about it again. So that just makes sense. And also if you wanna see like proper makeup tutorials, I do those too. Win, 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 win. So if you wanna see how I got this pink eye look with the new Huda Beauty Neon's Obsession palette, and talk about this book with me for a little bit. Let's just jump into it and get started on chapter one and my base, my foundation. We're doing that first. Base is already primed. I have a lip mask on my lips, so I'm ready to get going. So we start off in chapter one, as most books do. We start off, we're in the woods and it's the winter. And I don't know if you've ever been in the woods in the winter, but it's not a good time. So our POV character here, we don't really know who she is yet at this point, but she's out hunting and it's made very clear at this point of the book that she's hunting out of necessity because she keeps kind of going back to the idea that if she doesn't get something by the time the sun goes down and the sun is like almost down that she is probably not going to survive and neither are her sisters or her dad because they are really counting on her bringing home some food for the rest of the week and they explain that they have not had a lot of food for a very long time. She's also like really freaked out because there have been reports that there have been fairies seen in the area. And so to me, I was just like, in my mind, I'm picturing like freaking Tinkerbell. And I'm like, so what? Man up, you know, it doesn't matter. Who cares if there's fairies in the area? But apparently that's not it. That's not the type of fairies we are dealing with here, my friends. And she sees a deer. But the problem is there's also a wolf. Not only is there a wolf, but the wolf is huge. So she starts to wonder if because this wolf is so big, like so abnormally enormous, like is something up? Is this a fairy like in another creature's skin? Like she's worried that 
She's gonna go after this thing to defend herself and she's gonna have no chance because fairies, not only would they be enormous if they were a wolf, but like also they're pretty much unstoppable and like super powerful and she is freaked out. So the wolf is stalking the deer because he wants to eat the deer too, but she's like, okay, I'm gonna have to kill both of these guys right now, or I'm gonna either die of starvation or this wolf is gonna eat me, or if it's a fairy, he's gonna eat me and do whatever fairies do. So she makes a little plan in her head and she shoots the deer first. She kills it in one shot and it goes down. And then as soon as the deer goes down, she shoots and she hits the wolf. And now the wolf like looks up at her and like makes eye contact and she's like, why does this wolf look so like self-aware? Why did he just look into my soul? She takes another arrow out of her quiver and the arrow that she chooses is something called an ash arrow, which we learn shortly is one of the things that actually kills fairies is ash wood. And she takes him down by putting one shot through his eye. And at that point, now she's got a wolf and she's got a deer and there's no way that she can carry both of them out of the woods. So she skins the wolf and takes his pelt and wraps it around the deer and carries the deer and the pelt out of the wood back to her house. And that concludes chapter one. As we begin chapter two, she gets back to her house with this pelt and now we get to meet her family. Two sisters, both of whom are older than her and her dad who has a very serious injury on his legs that never healed. So he's not very mobile. As she starts explaining about her dad, she sort of hints around at the idea that he can actually do more than he lets on, but he kind of gave up after his injury, which I suppose we can't really fault him for, but she seems pretty frustrated by it because she's been like pulling a lot of the weight around there and trying to help her family survive. And she doesn't really feel like he's been doing the same. She also mentions that they have like these spells written on the doorways of their house that are supposed to ward off fairies or not allow fairies to enter, which really kind of just paints a picture for you how freaked out they are about these fairies and how they are definitely not Tinkerbell. She kind of knows that that would never really work anyway, that they really kind of have no defense against these things. She gets home with this deer in the pelt and both of her sisters are uh, to be honest with you, in the beginning, in this first chapter at least, you know, things, you start to develop characters as you go along, but in this first chapter, ooh, her sisters got on my nerves, let me tell you. So she brings home the deer and the pelt, and now keep in mind that this is literally the only thing that's keeping them alive. Like, they have no other food, they have no money, and her hunting these things and going out and risking her whole ass life in the woods as a 19-year-old girl, by the way, who is just really vulnerable out there with monster fairies, apparently, she's risking her life. So she comes home with the pelt, with the deer, and they kind of like aren't really freaked out enough that she shot a wolf, in my opinion. And also they won't even help her skin the damn deer. So both sisters are older than her. The oldest one is named Nesta and Nesta is kind of like the, the the bitchy one, for lack of a better term. She's a little bit selfish, especially toward our main character, Feyre. She doesn't really appreciate what Feyre's done for them, and she's a little bit entitled in a lot of ways. The other sister is Elaine, and Elaine is not really mean, but she's also a little bit selfish and entitled. But she's very sweet and more like almost like she's naive and kind of doesn't understand exactly how dire their circumstances are. But Elaine has done some really nice things for Feyre, so we kind of get a picture of her having a little bit more of like a giving character than the older sister Nesta. She bought Feyre some paints and Feyre painted little pictures all over their house and they live in like a really tiny little cottage that's really barely big enough for them to live in. So she painted like little flowers and different symbols for all three of them and for their dad and for their mom all over different parts of the house, like on the tables and inside of the drawers. Honestly, if I ever tried to pull that shit in my house when I was a kid, my dad would have lost his mind. But things were pretty grim in there anyway. So she used the art that she created to kind of like bring a little life 
and a little bit of color into their very dire situation. So she skins the deer and her sisters are being brats about chopping wood the next day. And they explain that they actually used to be very wealthy, but the dad lost their fortune and they went into a lot of debt over the situation. And eventually the debtors came kind of like the henchmen of the people he owed money to. And they came to collect the vig and they broke his knees in front of the girls. It was like super traumatizing. And that is how the dad wound up having the injury that never really healed right and not being able to walk properly and not really being able to work to support the family, which brings us to her hunting in the woods situation. So chapter three begins the next morning, Feyre and her two sisters, Elaine and Nesta. Feyre wants to take the pelt to town to try to sell it at the market. Also during that argument, Feyre found out that Nesta is supposed to be getting engaged to, I think the guy's name is Thomas. And he's basically like her little local boyfriend, but he belongs to a family that's like super questionable. Um, and there's like, suspicious things going on in his family between his dad and his mom and Farah's like dude you cannot marry him and Nesta's all like wow you're just jealous because your boyfriend is a loser and so her boyfriend is this guy named Isaac and it's not really her boyfriend he just kind of meets up with her and they hook up which is you know he, she needs a friend with benefits you know she needs a distraction from things so it works out pretty well but anyway, so they get into a really big argument about that. So this walk into town is awkward. Nobody's talking to each other at all. Everybody's really silent until they run into somebody on the road who is one of the people who apparently still worship the fairies that they're all so afraid of. We find out that these fairies used to rule the lands of the humans as well. And then there was like a big war. There is a big wall that's apparently invisible that separates them from the fairy land. Basically, these people go around every now and then to different towns and try to convert people into thinking that the fairies are good and that they should worship them and that they're their gods and that they need to work together. Apparently, that group is so disliked that they actually caused a disruption at the marketplace on the days they show up. So now Farrah is worried that people are gonna be too distracted and she's not gonna be able to sell her pelt. And she sees this huge female mercenary hanging out in like the center of town. And immediately she's like, I'm gonna go up to this lady and try to sell my pelts rather than going to the vendors that I usually go to because those guys look distracted as fuck today. And she kind of strikes up a little bit of conversation with her because the mercenary is like, how the hell did you kill a wolf this big? So she tells her how she did it essentially, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, and the mercenary is like, well, it doesn't look like it's a fairy. It looks like a real wolf. And then she buys it from her for like, way too much money. And Farrah's like, why? And she's like, well, somebody once did me a kindness in time of need. It looks like you and your sisters are in a time of need and I'm trying to repay that kindness. And then she kind of starts telling her like, hey, you really need to stay out of these woods because shit is starting to go down more and more often with these like more monstrous fairies that are coming through the wall. And the farther north you go, the more they're basically just gonna eat your ass for lunch. They go back for the night and they're all kind of settling in and all of a sudden a huge giant beast comes bursting through the door. Beauty and the Beast, except the beast is bigger, like even bigger. He's, they say he's like the size of a horse and he's got huge curling horns coming off of his head. So this enormous beast with golden fur and big horns is in their cottage and he is pissed because as it turns out, the wolf was a fairy, which obviously she had no way of knowing. And I don't know if like they fully understand that humans would never look at a wolf and be like, yeah, that's definitely a fairy because like it's a fucking wolf. You know what I mean? So Farah, being the way that she is, grabs a knife off the kitchen table and she's like, I'm going to defend us against this giant beast thing however I can, even though I know I basically have no shot. So Farah takes this basically like a butter knife and she tries to stab him but he is fast as shit and he like knocks it out of her hand gets out of the way instantly like it's not he basically laughed it off oh after she tries to stab him he explains that there is a treaty that took place after the war between humans and fairies and that essentially now because she killed one of them it's a life for a life but 
it doesn't have to be like a literal life for a life like he doesn't have to kill her it's almost like there's like a loophole where he can take her with him and she has to live in the fairy realm which is called prithian why would he not just kill her if he's so pissed you know i guess if he did that we wouldn't have a book to read <laughs> she goes with him to leave but she plans on trying to escape or like stab him or something as soon as she gets the chance but the dad actually musters up some emotion and he's like go with him and if you escape don't come back here you've always been too good for here anyway and if you do escape go somewhere else and make a name for yourself so chapter five starts with her and the beast walking off into the woods and there's a horse waiting for them so obviously he either brought this horse there to bring her back or he somehow rode this horse to her house but he's like bigger than the horse like the the beast his beastiness is enormous it's like way too big to ride a horse they start walking she's on the horse and in her head she's like holy shit i cannot believe i little old me murdered a fairy she's really impressed with herself and i gotta say i don't think that i blame her for being impressed with herself that is very pink wow she decides to ask him some questions which i mean this guy just like came and captured you because you killed his friend so i wouldn't imagine that he'd be very friendly so he uses magic powers which apparently he possesses in spades and knocks her out and uses magic bindings to tie her to her horse which brings us to chapter six so they roll up on his estate which is enormous and beautiful it's covered in like roses and ivory and surrounded by gardens and they get inside the foyer and a big flash of light happens and he turns from a big beast into like a hot golden haired man just like just like that so she just has no idea what's going on she backs away like all scared the fairy he is is something called the high fae which is the ruling fairy nobility class so she looks at him and she's like damn first of all this guy is really really good looking like holy shit he's really hot i don't think i've ever seen a guy that looked like this before in my life except that he is strangely wearing a masquerade mask why he's like you really need to eat something it's been a long journey and she's like no i can't because i've been told that the food that fairies have is like lethal to humans and you will use it to like control our minds and kill us and i was always told like if i ever came into the fairy realm for any reason that i absolutely cannot eat anything he's like what in the world are you talking about it's just food just eat at this point he's like look you don't have to live here in my manner you can live anywhere in the fairy realm that you want but you are welcome to live here with me if you like he makes it very clear that she's not a prisoner in his home so as they're at this table and she's refusing to eat another fairy walks in he's also wearing a mask but this guy has like long red hair also kind of a snack he's really hot too so she's like is this like a fashion thing what the fuck is with the masks but besides the mask, this guy has like a huge scar on his face and one of his eyes is completely missing and has been replaced with like a gold metal orb that functions. So it like moves around like a real eye. And at the end of this scene, they also introduce her to Alice, who is again wearing a mask and she's starting to really question this whole mask thing. Um, and Alice is not a high fae, she is a lesser fairy and she is like the handmaid that they give her for the house. So Alice helps her to get dressed and she's like, listen, I don't wanna wear this gown, I prefer to wear pants and a tunic. Chapter seven starts with her going down to eat dinner with Tamlin, who is the beast that transformed to the hot guy that came to get her, and Lucian, who is the other fairy with the metal eye that moves around. Tamlin is like, he's being like, weirdly nice to her and kind of tries to give her a compliment but he's sort of awkward and like really dorky about it and lucian the other one is like he's pretty standoffish understandably he's pretty pissed that she killed his friend he starts asking questions kind of wondering why they want her there what they want with her what they're gonna do with her what she's supposed to do with the rest of her life is she supposed to stay there forever and when she asks tamlin specifically what he wants for her his answer is nothing he says he wants nothing from her and he lets her know that the family will be taken care of that he wouldn't take away their sole source of survival and not have replaced it in some way and that she doesn't 
have to worry about that. But she kind of doesn't buy it, except for the fact that she's been told for like a long time, like her whole life, everybody's been telling her that fairies are incapable of lying. So then they're at dinner still and they start asking like all sorts of weird questions about her dating life, which I was just like, this is what you want to talk about right now? Like, it's weird. Dinner ends and she goes up to her room for the night, which is also really beautiful. And so she tries to barricade herself in the room for the night by like rigging up a basically a pulley system and like a snare that she created by ripping down the pretty curtains in the room. He also explains that the masks are not indeed a fashion statement of any sort, but they were stuck onto their faces by evil magic 49 years ago during a party where like somebody sent evil magic into the party and stuck the masquerade masks that they were wearing for the party onto their faces permanently kind of part of this thing that's like a blight like a like a magic disease that has been plaguing their lands ever since chapter eight is pretty short we just see her walk around the gardens and like kind of get a feel for where she's living right now she feels the whole time she's walking around there like somebody's watching her but every time she like tries to figure out who might be watching her there's nobody there she also goes to dinner that night and she steals a knife from the table and she tries to like stick it up her sleeve and she doesn't think that anybody notices at all but she thinks that maybe they might know and she's like oh god i don't know if i should have done that but she felt like she wanted to have something to try to defend herself even though it's clearly i mean the man can transform into like a giant beast so clearly a knife is a futile effort you know what i mean he slapped the one out of her hand the last time chapter nine starts where she's kind of talking about how she wants to get lucian on her side she's gonna try to get him to go on a ride with her to like get in on his own and like talk to him and like see if she can figure out through him without Tamlin around if there's any way that she can get like out of the deal. Now Alice had told her that basically Lucian probably needs somebody to put him in his place so she's kind of like feeling a little bit bold like she's gonna like talk back to him when he's all sarcastic and stuff because he's like the sarcastic one like he's super like I know he's got he's got jokes this guy so initially Tamlin wants to go on a ride with her around the property and like show her around and she's like nah thanks but then she goes and immediately finds Lucian and tries to go out on a ride with him and pretty quickly he calls her out on the fact that she like took him out there and wanted to go on a ride with him not to go for a hunt but like she wanted to try to get information out of him chapter 9 ends chapter 10 begins they're still out riding and they're just plotting along and all of a sudden there's like this horrible like I don't know I guess it's like a presence that just comes over them it just surrounds them and Lucian is like don't move don't look no matter what happens just look straight ahead and pretend you hear and see nothing and it's like swirling around them and the horses are kind of freaked out but even they sort of know to ignore it and pretend it's not there and it's like whispering in her ear and saying and saying look at me look at me and being like, generally just very terrifying she's like what was that and she's really really freaked out and terrified and she says that that was what she imagined when people told her the tales of like what happens in like the fairy territories so when they get back tamlin sees her with lucian and he is not happy that she turned him down for a ride and went out with lucian he seems a bit jelly to be honest with you. which is again weird like why do you care this is your captive you know you took her because she killed your friend but he's even less happy when he finds out that they ran into that creepy spirit which is called the bog by the way oh one little thing i forgot to mention earlier is when she was talking to alice alice said that she should be very careful because her human senses would play tricks on her there so that she couldn't really trust what she was seeing and hearing so it's been a long day she encountered a spirit monster in the woods tamlin's a little bit pissed at her so she goes up to her room to end the night and tam i believe goes off to like hunt the bog she's sitting by her window and she's just kind of chilling and she looks out the window and she sees guess what guess what she sees by the bushes her freaking dad she's like kind of shocked but also like part of her wants to see her dad do things like that for her so she was like really really like holy shit my dad came to get me that brings us to the start of chapter 11. now she grabs 
her stolen dinner knife. Now, I don't know how she doesn't question how her dad got there because I don't think that they had like transportation. Like I don't think they had horses and stuff for him to ride there. And it's like a two day ride. So she gets like halfway across the yard of this manor and she gets near the bushes where her dad is and she hears Tamlin come up behind her and he's like, where are you going? And she's like, my dad is here. And he's like, basically like your dad, LOL. Like he, he's like, uh, no girl, that is not your dad. He tells her to look again. And when he looks again, the dad's not there. So whatever thing it was that she saw is like a creature that can make you just see it as whatever you want to see to like lure you in. So she's obviously and understandably pretty freaked out by it. Tamlin's kind of pissed. He calls her a fool, which is rude. So he's like, what do you want? You know, like, what do you want? What would make you happy? And she's like, look, I really just want to go home. And she tells him about a promise that she made to her mother on her deathbed to take care of her sister. So apparently the mother died when she was eight years old and she made a promise to her mom that she would take care of the family. So Tamla's like, look, I know that you don't trust me, but believe me when I tell you that your family is way better cared for now than they were when you were around. And again, I have to wonder, why, why, why? And we get to see that like Tamlin is talking about like he never really wanted to be in his position, like his position of nobility. Um, and he sort of just resents it and does it because he has to. Okay, so chapter 12, in the middle of the night she gets up because she has a nightmare and she starts walking around the manor and like kind of mapping it because she wants to know where she is and like a little bit more about her surroundings. She's still kind of on guard. She doesn't trust these people and she wants to like at least have an idea of the house that she's living in. Also reveals that she doesn't know how to read and write properly. Like she can do a little, but not much. But as she's walking around, Tamlin comes in in his beast form and he's bleeding. So he had gone out and killed the bog. Which is like, they said that like it can't be killed, but apparently Tamlin is like super powerful and he was able to kill it. And he also asks her what the map is and figures out that she's illiterate by looking at it and just seeing that she was making like little scratch marks and stuff. He says that her being illiterate must be what led her to become so adept at other things. She kind of takes that as a compliment, which is like the first time she really accepted any sort of a compliment from him. And she takes them to the infirmary, like I said, and helps them bandage up his hand and she does like a really good job bandaging up his hand. She's still like really freaked out about how powerful he is, but they bond a little bit over the idea again that like they both have people to care for and like this burden of caring for others before yourself kind of a thing. So after she bandages him up, he goes to talk to Lucian about the fact that he killed the bog and she's kind of eavesdropping by the door. Oh, I just messed up that eyeliner so bad. Um, but she overhears them saying things like, we're running out of time. There are not that many days left. Uh, Lucian sounds pissed and he says things like, you're gonna seal our fate. Tamlin basically tells her that he knows that she stole the knife and that she doesn't need to do things like that. But he kind of like sounds like he admires that she tried, you know? And he also says like, obviously I was gonna hear you eavesdropping. Like you can't be running around doing stuff like that and expect me not to know you're coming because I have fairy senses and you do not. Chapter 13 starts and Tamlin shows her the study that's in the manor and it's like huge and beautiful and there are all these huge murals inside of it. She also starts ruminating on the fact that Tamlin referred to her illiteracy as a shortcoming and she's like kind of pissed about it, but it's not like she's pissed at him for saying it because he was kind of being nice about it. I think it's more like she's embarrassed, but it's like he's trying to be nice and he's really bad at it. Like he just really cannot get it right. She goes to find Lucian. He, she wants more information. She wants to know more about like what's going on. What's with this blight thing? Who are you guys? Like what is, what's the tea is what she wants to know. And Lucian's like, basically, look, I can't tell you, but there are these type of fairies that live in the woods. And if you happen to snare one, even though it is an absolute atrocious monster, you can get it to tell you basically anything and it knows everything. So he doesn't really tell her. He like sneaky in like a backhanded way so he can't get in trouble with Tamlin, tells her how to go out and snare this thing called the Surreal. So she gets it. She actually snares this creepy freaking thing and she starts asking it questions and she finds out that there's a king across the water who wants everybody dead essentially that he wants to take back over everything and he wants to take back over the human realm as well and this guy is an absolute creep like his throne is made of human bones like he does not like people at all 
So she keeps asking the surreal about the blight and he won't give her any answers. He just keeps saying like about this war that started 100 years ago with this guy who's the king of another fairy kingdom called Highburn. And she keeps asking about the blight and it won't answer, which is very interesting because it is said to know everything and it is said to always answer if you ask a question. So it's a little odd that she's asking him about the blight and he's not he's like kind of like avoiding the topic and every time she asks him about it he keeps repeating that she just needs to stay by Tamlin's side. He also reveals that Tamlin is not just a high fae but he's the high lord of the spring court so he's like basically like the governor. He's like one of the seven most powerful fairies in the whole wide world and that everything will be righted in the end if she just stays with the High Lord. And then as she's like just about to try to get more information out of him about the situation and the blight and all of that, they get snuck up on by these other creepy type of fairies that live in the woods and she has got to go. So we start chapter 15, she's running away from these creepy fairies, she is out of there. They catch up to her, they grab her, they're like clawing at her and stuff, and she kind of puts up a fight, she does a pretty good job, but she really would have got her ass handed to her if Tamlin hadn't showed up. Now, by the way, mind you, when Lucian told her how to do this whole thing, he insinuated to her that he would be out there riding, so she ran into a ton of trouble that he would show up if she screamed for help, and he did not. She did kill one of them herself though, so props to her for that because that was, it was, it was scary. I would have pooped my pants. Oh, also an important note, she let the surreal go and like freed him from her snare before she ran off. So she kind of like sacrificed her own safety to make sure that that scary creature was okay, which was very nice of her. And like a lot of people probably wouldn't have done it that way, but she let it go and made sure that it could get away too because, um, I don't know, Farrah's, Farrah's a pretty nice person, it would seem. Chapter 16 starts with them back at the manor and she starts kind of asking Alice some questions now. She wants to know more, you know? She wants to know more about what's going on. She wants to know more about the blight. She wants to know more about the history because like, I don't know, she's gonna have to live there and be involved in all of this. I would want to know too. Alice basically tells her to shut up and mind your own business and they'll take care of it. So that night she goes to dinner and Lucian sarcastically says, you look lovely tonight. And she, in response, goes, I thought fairies couldn't lie. Like, ha ha ha, I know you're being a sarcastic dick. And he's like, what? And Tamlin's like, what the hell are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, every human knows that fairies can't lie. And they basically laugh her out of the dining room. Apparently, fairies could lie the whole time. Now, Tamlin reassures her that they actually haven't lied to her about anything. And at this point, it almost seems like she trusts him. So she takes his word for it. But like, imagine, can you imagine? He also tells her in this conversation that he used a spell called a glamour to like change her family's memories so they don't know that she was swept away by a giant beast man. They think that she left to go help an elderly aunt who was really wealthy. He also wove something into the spell that made them so that if like something happens with the king guy that the surreal told her about, that they'll run at the first sign of trouble. So that way like she doesn't have to worry about them. So at this point she's like, okay, I'm really gonna stay here. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I've i got nothing to do day to day. I don't have a job here. Like I don't even know who the hell I am in this world. So she asks him for some paint and he's like, whoa, like that's what you want? Yeah, of course you can have paint. So he's like, not only can you have paint, but did you know we have like an entire art gallery of incredible paintings in this house. So he's like, look, we can't go see the gallery right now because I got to leave tomorrow and it's like really dirty. I've had it closed up for years. Nobody else here was ever really interested in it. So I'm going to have them clean it tomorrow and then we're going to, and we'll go when I get back from whatever business I got to go away on tomorrow afternoon. Also within a couple of days, you should have some paints and shit, which will be super fun. And she's excited. And I think for the first time, she kind of feels like comfortable and like can relax a little bit. So that night she goes to bed and she has nightmares about the surreal, which same, I would too. She wakes up in the middle of the night from this nightmare, but when she wakes up, she hears like real life shouts and screams downstairs and she's like, oh shit, like what the hell's going on? So she goes down and she finds Tamlin dragging in a fairy who is like really, really injured and screaming and bleeding all over the floor. Like it's horrible. And he's got like, 
bloody stumps on his back and he starts crying she took my wings she took my wings and he says it over and over again it's all he could say as he's like basically bleeding out on the dining room table so she sits down at the table and she holds this fairy's hands and he's like literally just like bleeding out and dying on the table and she kind of comforts him until he passes and then when he does pass tamlin's like why did you do that and she's like well i would want somebody to do the same for me i wouldn't want to die alone and he kind of looks at her like you know like i didn't expect this from you like their 18 starts the next day Feyre goes and she wants to find Tamlin and like really like deeply apologize for killing his friend because she realizes like how upset he was about that fairy that he found on his property and like if he's that upset about that then imagine how he feels about the friend that she killed. She gets there, he's got horses waiting for her and him and Lucian and he kind of like dorkily stumbles over his reasoning as to why he thought they could all go for a ride that day. But he takes them out to this glen and it's like this amazing enchanted place where there is a pool of starlight and she's like what is this place and he says that it's just a glen and that it was like his favorite place to hang out when he was like a little boy which means that it was like probably around 500 years because apparently he was a boy in the first war that they talked about, which was about 500 years ago. So that means that he's gonna be over 500. He's, he's real old, which is really weird actually now that I'm thinking about them like flirting and stuff because like, yeah, like he looks young, you know, he because they're immortal, they don't age, but like really the age gap is like on another level here. So Tamlin explains Lucian's past a little bit. He doesn't explain the eye, but he says that Lucian's dad executed his girlfriend in front of him because she wasn't good enough for the family because she wasn't nobility. And that's why he left his dad's court and came to live with Tamlin. Tamlin actually helped him kill his brothers who were coming after him. So that's like their whole sordid past. And Lucian's been with him ever since. He asked her what would make her happy and she really doesn't have an answer for it. And then eventually she's like, all right, whatever, I'll just go for a swim with this guy. And that's when she's like really like started to be like, ooh, he is really hot swimming around in this starlight this is a good time I'm enjoying myself here and he is hot as shit also at this point in this scene Lucian kind of comes up to her and apologizes for not being there to save her when she went to snare the cereal like he said that he would be he feels really bad about it he gives her his knife as a way of apology and just says please don't use it to stab me in the back chapter 19 they're back at the house and her painting supplies have arrived they go into the gallery it's like insanely beautiful like more beautiful than any human thing that she's ever seen and it takes her breath away like to the point where she's like literally in tears crying at the beauty of these paintings which makes me want to see them so bad and then she gets her painting supplies and literally like days and weeks pass of her painting without anything else like that's all she thinks about is all she does she's just completely engrossed in painting for these weeks the only time she doesn't paint is when Tamlin goes out to protect the borders because now like she likes him and she likes spending time with him and she misses him when he's gone and she worries about him and stuff. But eventually she kind of snaps back into reality and realizes she's painted for all these weeks and she hasn't thought about her family. And then she feels guilty for not having felt guilty for being away from her family in that time, which I understand and I can relate to, but also like, I don't know, you're there girl, you might as well enjoy yourself, I guess, you know? So that night she's a little bit upset and she goes out to the garden and Tamlin follows her out there and he's like, hey, what's going on? And she explains that she's like upset with herself for not feeling upset that she's not with her family, basically. And he's like, look, you shouldn't really feel that way because they didn't even try that hard to stop me from taking you. And she's like, mm, you know what? You got a point. So she rips a rose off and she like rips her hand apart on the rose bushes and Tamlin comes over and like kisses them real gently and heals them up in seconds, which she's got this magic healing powder, powder, power. She's like, why do you care about any of this? Like, why do you like me? Why are you being nice to me? And he says this whole thing about how the short lives of humans make them feel things so much more intensely than fairies do. And he's like entranced by it and taken with how they experience emotion and how they experience life, which I like I, the way it was written sounds like it's supposed to be really nice, but like that sound, it sounded really condescending to me. Like if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, okay. But at this point, she's kind of like accepted the fact that she wants the D, you know, she likes him. She, 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 she wants to, she wants to get some of that. 
He also explains at this point that there's something called like a mating bond between fairies that's like more important than marriage and it's like something that just clicks into place in their brain when they meet somebody and they're like oh that's my mate and like essentially from what he said i don't know if this is how it works but like if you're already married and you meet your mate it doesn't even matter your marriage is like that doesn't even mean anything because you found your mate now he also tells her that there's a fairy holiday coming up and that it's something called fire night and that she is absolutely under no circumstances whatsoever allowed at all to go there at all ever no matter what he she is not allowed to come and she's like kind of insulted about it but she, she he's real serious like she cannot go chapter 20 starts it's the day of fire night and she goes to ask alice if she can help prepare the food for the event she goes down to the kitchens and like nobody's even there goes back to her room and like at 10 o'clock at night she can't take it anymore and she goes outside and she starts walking towards the celebration even though Tamlin told her not to go and she's walking along she's like near the edge of the woods and three guys come up and they surround her and they like start to they're, they're being very aggressive it's a very scary situation it seems like they are going to assault her and drag her off into the woods right before these people are about to drag her off to god knows what this guy shows up and he's like so she really lays it on thick about how handsome tamlin is but she sees this guy she says the most beautiful man she has ever seen in her life and she describes him as tall and dark and he's got dark short hair that's like almost so black that it's blue and he's got purple eyes and she says that she could see like tendrils of night streaming around his body so as soon as he shows up these guys are freaked they want nothing to do with him this guy's dressed in all black and he's like kind of like got the cool guy thing going on totally different than Tamlin very very different from Tamlin and he's kind of like he's got swag you know like this guy's a little bit he's got an attitude about him a little bit you know quite frankly she's a little bit freaked out by him too but he saved her so she's really grateful so the start of chapter 21 she's standing and she's talking to this stranger who just saved her and he uh quite frankly is basically a sexy scary stranger that's how the best i can describe him starts asking questions about like why a mortal woman is at fire night now she still doesn't really know what fire night is about she lies to him about what she's doing there she says she's there with like a couple of her girlfriends who happen to be fairies and she also keeps saying how arrogant he is, which to me is really interesting because like she says it because of the fact that he turns around and he's like, oh, you're welcome for saving you, by the way. But in reality, he wasn't, I don't think he was really being arrogant because he just saved her from like, God knows what those creeps were gonna do. And she didn't really say thank you. <laughs> so he offers to escort her somewhere safe, but she doesn't trust him. But as he's about to walk away, she's like, hey, are you a part of the spring court? And he's like, ha, no. <laughs> so she asks, well then why are you here? And he responds with a very eerie answer and says, all of the monsters have been out of their cage tonight and we can go wherever we want. So she hurries way back into the crowd because she's like, what the fuck does that mean? And she gets there and she runs into Lucian and Lucian basically loses his mind with annoyance about her being there. He flips out, he throws her over his shoulder and literally runs back into the manor. So when Lucian drops her in the front hallway, he explains what was going on at this holiday. For the year to come, they need to fertilize the crops with magic and they create the magic with this ritual which is called the right and basically the high lord of the land has to pick a lady and go into this cave and have sex with her and the magic from that sex fertilizes the lambs they like go into like a trance of like not being themselves and lucian says that if she was there tamlin would have chosen her and it wouldn't have been pretty so that's why they wanted her locked up for the night and then 2 a.m rolls around and she's like i need a midnight snack even though you already knew that you shouldn't be creeping around tonight like everybody told you you learned the hard way once goes down to the kitchen she gets a ton of snacks she comes back she's got a cookie in her hand and she runs into tamlin in the hallway and essentially he says like i know you were there i could smell you there it was driving me crazy and she's like well, what does that mean what do you mean she's kind of jealous that he's coming back so late because she's like oh that means that he must have liked whatever girl he picked to go into the cave with he pins her against the wall and she drops her cookie on the floor which is quite frankly the most relatable thing i've ever read in my life and he's acting like really feral and not like himself and like she can see in his eyes that like he's not 
all there. He pins her up against the wall and like she's like kind of into it and she's like pushing up against him and stuff like getting like a little bit kinky with him and he bites her neck like here. She says it's like where her shoulder meets her neck and he bites her hard. Essentially he lets her go after he bites her neck. She goes back to her room. She can't really stop thinking about it. She's like kind of really into it and then she brings us to chapter 22. So she wakes up the next day. It's pretty late. She's still thinking about it. She can't stop thinking about this neck bite situation. So she shows up at lunch. Lucian it looks like half dead from the night before and he's like what happened to your neck? And then she says Tamlin did it to me and he's like what the hell? Why? And she explains that he she was in the hallway and he's like come on like we told you not to go out of your room. And Tamlin takes like no responsibility for it like whatsoever like he just is like whatever. She calls them both fairy pigs. She runs off to her painting room and she spends the rest of the day painting pictures of them with pig features. They all go to dinner that night they all apologize to each other and he brings her a bouquet of roses from his parents garden which is like really meaningful and for some reason she acts like she doesn't care but like she really does care. The next night when Alice goes to get her ready for dinner she asks to wear a dress instead of her tunic and pants which is like kind of shocking to Alice. She's super nervous about wearing the dress to dinner and she shows up and like literally the second she gets there Lucian dips and her and Tamlin sit down to dinner on their own and first thing she says little miss flirty pants over here goes well you're way too far away so to show off he like basically snaps his fingers and the table turns into like a little table for two so they have a super flirty romantic dinner and then afterwards she takes him to see the paintings that she's done so far and she has one specifically for him that she wants to give him but the one that he actually wants is the one of the woods that she used to hunt in because he kind of feels like that one is more representative of who she is as a person and it means more to him and like the connection that they have with each other about like this burden that they both carried. Which brings us to chapter 23 which is our last chapter of the day. It's the next day and it's kind of like a lazy day again and now they go out to a glen but it's not the one that he brought her to originally. It's a little bit different. It's not as like you know hoity-toity there's no pool of moonlight in this or starlight or whatever it was in this one it's just like a really pretty glen so she turns to him and he's like wow the singing of that willow tree really puts me to sleep and she's like what are you talking about and he's like oh I forgot that you can hear it with your human senses and essentially he explains to her that fairies have like their senses are not just like they can hear better or they can see better like they can like that's all true too but there is like a whole like spectrum of stuff that they sense that doesn't even register in human ears and human eyes. He tells her that he can give her that experience for a moment if she gives him something in return and he says that what he wants is a kiss. So at first she's like no way and then he's like oh come on and she's like okay fine. He closes her eyes and kisses her on each eyelid and all of a sudden she can like hear the tree singing a song and the birds sound like a symphony and she sees all these colors that she didn't see before and the waterfalls of rainbow and it's all amazing. And she looks at him and he looks like more magnificent than anything she's ever seen in her life and he she realizes that that's like really what he looks like all the time like she can see the power of him being a high lord and she can't usually see that. And he explains that he literally uses a glamour to make himself look less special all the time so he can blend in with other people in life better. Then he asks for his kiss that she promised and she just grabs his hand and kisses him on the back of the hand and he thinks it's hilarious and he laughs. She starts to feel like really drowsy. I guess maybe the magic that he used on her is very draining for a human to like bear on their little human soul and she starts to fall asleep. And as she falls asleep he says you're exactly how I dreamed you would be which is really a weird thing for him to say if you think about the context of the situation. And that is where our chapter 23 ends. And that is where we should make a note that shit's about to get real. But that's where we're gonna leave off for today. In two weeks, we will continue the rest of this book with another Get Ready With Me. Please leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on anything I commented on or like just anything maybe I missed in the books as we got up to this point. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it because that'll let me know that you guys like this new series that we started here and I can continue to do them. If you're new here, please don't forget to subscribe. Besides these videos, I also do just regular makeup videos here. If you want to see my other makeup, please don't forget to come follow me over on Instagram. I am at Ms. Quinface over there. I post all sorts of fun stuff and lip art and close-ups of makeup that we do here in these videos. And I would love to have you. Like I said, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you think. Let me know who your favorite character is. Whatever opinion you have about the book, I want to know below. Do you like Tamlin? Do you think that she should hook up with him? 
I want to know. That's all for today. Thank you for hanging out with me and talking about this book and doing some makeup. I really enjoyed it and I hope you did too. I appreciate each and every single one of you and I will see you in the next one.